So we're very fortunate to have, all the way from Zurich, our good friend, Sarai Barriman. Um, barely needs introduction, but we'll do it anyway. FIFA <laughs> Chief of Women's Football, former OFC uh, Deputy General Secretary, and former Football Federation Samoa CEO, and uh, former international footballer. We can't forget that. <laughs> Um, so Sarai, uh, it's good to have you with us. I'm sure you want to say hi to everyone. I do actually. I'm just looking at all these familiar faces and it's so nice to see. And I can't wait to hear some accents actually as well. I'm sick of hearing the, the Swiss German accents. So I want some, some Pacific region accents as well. I'm looking forward to that on this call. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get a few of those. Um, so I think what we're going to start with is just to ask how you're doing, how it's been going over in, in Switzerland and Zurich for you during this pandemic. It's going okay now. Uh, yeah, to be honest, there was a, an, an adjustment period at the beginning, which I think everyone experienced. Um, in Europe, the situation is, is quite bad. Um, in Switzerland, uh, we're right on the border of Italy, uh, which was the epicenter in Europe. Um, and the Swiss government was uh, quite late to close the borders here. So we got a lot of influx um, of people from, from Italy when the kind of virus started taking off. Um, so it's been strange. This is my eighth uh, week in home office now. <laughs> Um, I've definitely gone, you know, around the circle in terms of, you know, being sane and then having moments of insanity as well. <laughs> um, but I think it's good. I, I, we have a routine going now. I've got a home office set up um, and I've never used technology more than I have during this period. And I have to say it's been, uh, it's been eye opening to see how much can actually be done remotely. And uh, I think it will definitely contribute to a new way of working um, once this thing is over. What has it been like leading your team remotely? Like you said, that technology obviously has been really good, but what's it, how have you managed to do that? Uh, it's been quite challenging uh, because there's so many different platforms. I think the technology part of it is challenging in itself because uh, everyone has their own preferences on, on what platforms they want to use. Uh, but to be honest, it's been okay. Uh, I try to talk to everyone um, on a regular basis in team calls, but also individually. And I think the most important thing during a time like this is to um, recognize that everyone is reacting to this situation in a different way, and everyone is in a different situation. And you often don't know what's going on in their personal lives and, and with their families. So to be really sensitive um, in that um, and, and to treat everyone, I think, first and foremost, with, a, with um, an approach to their well-being and health, um, not only physically, but also mentally, because it's been a, a very stressful time. So for me, I have a very tight knit team um, and I'm in constant contact with them, even on WhatsApp. We have a group going where we send memes to each other as well. Um, it's important to have some laughs, I think, amongst it all. Uh, but in terms of the work, um, obviously we're not traveling as much as, as what we normally would do, um, which uh, I have to be honest for me is a kind of a blessing in disguise. It's nice to be grounded in one place for such a long period. Um, and it's given us really a chance to kind of uh, step back, uh, do a lot of planning work um, and really reflect on uh, the work that we're doing and also how can we adjust what we're doing now and uh, knowing that there's gonna be some changes once we come out of the situation. So, um like you said, like feelings during this period of being kind of like uh, up and down mentally, it's been quite tough. Uh, how do you manage to keep the staff and yourself motivated? Uh, I think the first thing is just recognizing and verbalizing it with them uh, that, that 
acknowledging the fact that this isn't an easy period for everyone. And I think that when they see that, yes, um, you know, I'm not expected to be 100% all the time during this moment, it gives them, I think, a little bit of freedom to feel that, okay, today I'm not going to log on because I'm not feeling the best or whatever it may be. So acknowledging it, I think, and speaking about it openly is really important. Um, and then also trying to do fun things. So for example, next week on Wednesday, we're gonna do a, a quiz. We're having like a kind of a, a few drinks as a team and we're gonna do like a virtual pub quiz, um, which everyone is really excited about. Um, when we do our team calls, you know, we always have a kind of an activity that we do first up, like a challenge. Uh, where everyone either has to give an interesting fact or say something about their week or we even are doing like a show and tell of something from your house to show to the rest of the team. So I think keeping, um, keeping the humour and that personal connection that normally comes naturally when you're all in the same office, you have to work a bit harder to get it virtually. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very lucky in, uh, because I have a very motivated, um, passionate team. So whilst we all have our ups and downs, uh, we're very connected um, and, and in sync with each other. And, um, and for me, I'm also very flexible. I mean, we're working from home during this time. I don't require everyone to be online from kind of nine to five. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in this situation. And as long as the work is being done, um, you know, it's it's fine. One thing you mentioned is technology um, being a godsend and, and being really helpful during a time like this. And we're fortunate that we have such advanced technology. Um, although in the Pacific, as we know, um, there's a lot of factors that come into uh, internet power devices whether you actually have the right resources in order to um, to use them so any ideas around um, if for example these things aren't available to you um, how you could keep people motivated yeah it's uh, it's I, I'm very aware that in many of our developing uh, member countries the connectivity is not as good. Um, and you see it a lot actually in the in the conversations that we're trying to have with our stakeholders. Um, but to be honest, it's a, you know these things they were just telephones before they became kind of handheld computers. And there's nothing wrong with actually picking up the phone and having a phone call. It doesn't have to be by Zoom or Skype or Teams or whatever it is. Um, and things is there's tools like. Uh, WhatsApp, texting, anything like that, you can stay connected. And in some ways, I think it could be quite nice to go back a little bit to where we were before having, you know, one-to-one -one phone conversations. Another thing that I've seen that has worked, uh, was quite nice for our team in the beginning of the week is that we started to send each other uh, postcards and cards, uh, virtually, but also physically. Like I've received uh, more kind of postcards and cards in these last six, seven weeks than I have in years. And it's actually so nice to get a physical piece of paper with a note on it. It's something that really can brighten your day. So yeah, we've been exchanging uh, cards and postcards as well. It seems a bit corny, but you'll be amazed when you receive one in your mailbox, uh, how uplifting it can be. Um, so yeah, I think we have to take a step back where we need to um, and, and go back to the way things were before we had all this technology. Yeah, that is um, definitely something that, that we've all, I guess, had to think about um, is taking a step back from technology and just going back to the roots, which actually leads me to a question that Lighty had. So Lighty, if I can just get you to, I'm just going to unmute you because I know you have a really good question for Sarai that I'm sure you're dying to ask. So over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Hello, Sarai. Um, Hi, Lighty. As you, <laughs> um, as you may aware that our growth participation pilot project just launched and after the launching program in the following week, 
the government uh, 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 got us to lock down. And it's been nine weeks now. <laughs> but um, what I have been doing is just, you know, like what you just mentioned, is making a phone call once a week to just to keep our volunteers, because we have 82 volunteers and uh, more than 500 uh, girls were uh, participating. And uh, somehow I could tell in, uh, in this, this week, uh, phone call conversation, the, the interest, it's kind of drift away. But mm -hmm. uh, just uh, any recommendation of, uh, you know what, because I'm, uh, right now I'm, I don't know when will be this uh, restriction lift. So probably in another uh, month, but uh, I, I don't want them to, to leave us because <laughs> yeah. uh, we haven't started the program. It's just a launching, so. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, for those of you that don't know, Laite is uh, from Tonga and she is in charge of women's football there. She is a incredible driving force behind uh, growing participation um, in women's football in Tonga. Um, and is doing an incredible job there together with uh, her team and the rest of the Federation. Um, and we recently uh, launched together with uh, the Federation in Tonga a, a participation program, a new program uh, to get more uh, women and girls playing football there. And yeah, I, what you're describing, Light here, is a is a, a very very common situation in many of our uh, member associations. And I think there are different tools that you can use. Uh, one thing that I've seen that other member associations are doing to kind of keep that level of motivation is uh, things like online challenges, for example, um, because the volunteers may not be able to interact with the players themselves. Uh, it doesn't mean that they can't still go out and set up a drill and practice running through it themselves or look at the activities that were planned during the training sessions. Um, and you could, they can set each other challenges for that time. Uh, for example, you could put a challenge to the team, you know, that they, uh, they have to set up one of the particular drills um, and get everything in place, record themselves and explain how they go through it. They could even use their family members, for example, and then they have to submit it. And it could be like an ongoing weekly challenge. And you can use the, uh, the curriculum that you have um, to guide what those challenges are. So whilst it would hopefully keep them motivated, at the same time, it's reminding them of the content and keeping them fresh so that when things do come back, hopefully they're ready to go off the mark. That's, that's brilliant. We'll, we'll try to do that uh, <laughs> next week. <laughs> I don't know how your, um, how your connectivity is um, lighter, but another thing that could be really nice is to have a forum like this. Um, I know you're doing the individual calls, but um, like this, for example, I think House Party is quite a popular one that you can use your mobile phone. It's just an app that you can download where you can have a lot of people at one time. It could also be really nice to have a forum where everyone can talk. And to be honest, it doesn't just have to be about the program and, and football. Sometimes it's nice just to have conversations with others who are going through the same thing. Um, for me, that'd mm -hmm. certainly be something that it has been quite uplifting and also why I was really excited to do this call. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Sarai. We'll, uh, Keep going, right here. You are amazing. You're amazing. I love your work. <laughs> Now, um, Margaret Acker from uh, Papua New Guinea has a question for you next. So over to you, Maggie. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Morning, everyone. Morning, Sarai. Hi, Margaret. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding um, structure for women's football. Um, is there a way that uh, FIFA women's football can help BMAs to establish a proper structure for women's football um, around the world. I believe other places have um, structures in place. Um, basically, this question is for 
uh, Pacific Island countries. I see that men's football take the center stage and they're always upfront with everything with men's football. Is there a way that, um, you know, you and your team can help um, put in place some structures for women's, women's football around the Pacific? An emphasis on um, how women's football can do things and it has to run alongside men's football. At the moment, we're behind while men's football is taking um, the center stage. Yeah, yeah. Good question, Margaret. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed I can't see your beautiful face though, I have to say. <laughs> no, <I'm>, <laughs> <laughs> I just woke up, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting video on right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a it's a really good question, Margaret, and I know that uh, I I know the the specific challenges that you have in Papua New Guinea. Um, I think I think what's really important, um, even before you think about structure, is to have a clear strategy in place and a clear plan. Um, it's important to understand actually what are the what are you aiming for? Are you looking to introduce new competitions? Is your focus on development? Are you looking at the elite end of the game? Are you trying to attract more players at the grassroots level? And in your case, I know it's probably all of the above. So it's exactly. really important um, uh, that you have a clear plan in place because I think a plan is the thing that dictates, first of all, what the structure should look like. Um, in terms of FIFA um, and the support we can offer, I'm excited to uh, tell you guys that we will be launching in the next few weeks uh, a new FIFA Women's Development Program, um, which is something that all the 211 FIFA member associations will be able to apply for. Um, this is hot off the press, so I'm happy that Oceania region will be the first actually to hear about this. Um, and it's a series of programs uh, that you can apply for in areas like uh, league support, uh, participation for grassroots level, um, coach uh, mentorship and scholarships for coaches. And one of the ones which I think will be really key for the Oceania region is uh, women's football strategy workshops. Uh, and for those that either don't have a strategy or want to enhance their existing strategy, um, we can come down to you with a framework and really look at how um, you can put together a clear and concrete plan linked to objectives and resources and structure. Um, and I think what's really important in the Pacific is getting the buy-in of the general secretaries and the presidents as well and including them in that process uh, so that when you do roll out and implement, uh, you've, got, you've got their support as well. So these programs, uh, we're going to be launching them in the next couple of weeks. Um, obviously, with activity halted, um, we expect that a lot of our member associations won't actually be able to um, start the activities. So what we're going to do is op have an open-ended application process. Um, which means that you will be able to apply every month. We'll assess the applications as they come in. And we've started to adapt already uh, a lot of the programs where there are parts of them that can be delivered virtually. So we're looking at um, online uh, virtual trainings where it's uh, possible. Uh, but that is something that I think will be able to concretely uh, help you, Margaret. And the good thing about it, uh, for those of you that uh, are familiar with the FIFA structures, we have the FIFA Forwards uh, funding, which is where our member associations get their money from. The women's football programs are going to be separate from FIFA Forward. So you don't have to go through FIFA Forward in order to get them. It's a separate menu. You can apply for it separately. Um, and it's something that I hope will really empower uh, those that are in charge of women's football, especially in the Pacific, um, to really pick programs that will support them uh, directly without having to worry about funding through the forward program. Hope that helps, Margaret. Knowing Maggie that that will be very good news for her and I think for everyone actually, um, sounds like a really good program that you guys are about to wind out there. 
Yeah, it's exciting. We've been um, we've been working on it actually for more than a year now, and it's a culmination of uh, several pilot projects that we've rolled out, and also uh, a lot of um, I would say research to understand the needs of our member associations. And I, something that I saw in the past when I was working in Samoa is uh, quite often you would get FIFA coming in to offer workshops and support and it was always good to have that um, but in many cases it was coming from a very European perspective it was some European instructors with no idea about the context of the Pacific Islands or the countries that they were visiting um, and often it would be such a waste of resource because it would kind of fly in one ear and out the other um, so our approach is really about making things tailor-made and, and for the country and for the specific needs of those countries. And that's something that we worked really hard on uh, in Tonga with Laite and her team. Um, and I wanna continue to do that because I'm really uh, passionate that if you don't make the support that you offer tailor-made to the situation in that country, it's not going to have a sustainable impact. I think I can see a lot of heads nodding in regards to that, that statement, so <laughs> I think that resonated with everyone. Um, so we have a question from Anna, and if I, hopefully I'm saying this correctly, Anna Jamali. Um, so Sorry. we'll just bring her in. Awesome, very good pronunciation, thank you very much. <laughs> Hey, Sarai, um, just um, want to say yeah, I'm really proud to see someone um, of your skin colour and a woman in, in the role, <laughs> holding such a role in FIFA and it, it really warms my heart and it makes me really proud. Um, I used to go to your brother's gym um, a long time ago and I used to hear updates from Polly um, about how you would progress in your career. Um, so yeah, I just really think that's awesome. Um, Thank but you. Yeah, cool. Um, but I just want to say, um, you know, what, what we see um, with you and your leadership, that is real meritocracy. Like, you have gone to your role because you deserve to be there. But I think a lot of Pacific women or um, women from ethnic minorities don't necessarily get those opportunities. Um, or even, um, even men um, who are from a different non-European um, ethnic background um, and you know if we look at football administration in New Zealand um, we see you know what you were just talking about that European perspective is quite heavy in in New Zealand football and although they might make some small attempts to employ people from different backgrounds there's not that real buy-in um, or want to tailor things for our Māori communities or Pacific communities or even, you know, communities that traditionally, those immigrant communi communities that traditionally play football, um, like M Middle Eastern and so forth. So um, how, um, my question is, how do we disrupt the system in New Zealand um, where diversity is welcomed and those opportunities are there for, for all, meritocracy does occur, um, you know, because right now there are discrepancies and it's not just for football in New Zealand. We also see it in rugby, um, where a lot of our talent comes from the Pacific, but we don't necessarily see that at the top. Um, so, yeah, what can we do to disrupt these systems? Um, yeah, to create a better game and where people feel more welcome. Yeah, really, really good question. Uh, and a very complicated <laughs> area, I have to be honest. Um, I know, for example, we've got Phil Parker on our call, and he is someone that is working um, in Indigenous football in New Zealand. And uh, I remember some years ago uh, f having many conversations with Phil, actually, about the difficulties um, in, in trying to basically mainstream um, the sport and the representation of our people in the sport. Um, it, it's certainly not a, an easy thing. And yeah, I have to say, by far and away, I'm, I'm the only Pacific Islander uh, at the FIFA level. Um, 
And yeah, I, I still get a few funny looks when I walk down the corridors with my flowers in my ear. So I, I feel it personally also um, on, on a regular basis. I think uh, there are many different mechanisms that we can use. Uh, I think one that is really important is having a collective voice. Um, I think it's important that those that are involved, and, and I love to see all the people that are participating on this call, because there are so many familiar faces. And in, in this alone, you can actually see uh, the collective voice that is potentially there. So I think uh, many voices are always stronger than one. So having a collective voice, I think, is really important. But also I think that it's about those of us that do uh, manage to make it into those positions and that have been fortunate enough to um, be in, uh, given opportunities uh, like myself, like many of our uh, member associations who have uh, women who are in um, good positions. I think it's important for them also to advocate all the time. And that's something that I, almost people roll their eyes when I go on about it. But in, in many conversations I have, I always, always mention where I'm from. I'm from the Pacific. This is what I've learned. This is how I came from. You know, this is, I started in Samoa. These are the women that are from my region. These are the programs that they're doing. And I'm constantly going on and on about it because people need to know. And if they're not told, they just don't know about it. So it's about advocacy as well, uh, the collective voice. And I think it's also about strategy, to be honest. Uh, sports is highly, highly political and football within the sporting landscape is a very, very political game. And I don't think it's, uh, I don't think that you have to be a politician in order to understand how to navigate the political landscape. And, uh, you know, I've always considered myself as an administrator. I, I'm not into the politics of sport. But one thing that has been very, very valuable to me is to understand how the politics works. So knowing in your member association or your club or whatever it is, your community organization, whatever it may be, understanding how the politics work, who are the decision makers, what are the different committees and bodies and how do they all feed into the ultimate decision-making processes? And once you have an understanding of that, aligning yourselves with the right people within those structures. And it doesn't always have to be in an aggressive way. You know, you've got to use, uh, what I would say for us women is often a, an instinct, a womanly instinct to see and understand sometimes even personal connections and how you can use those uh, strategically to, um, to navigate the politics of the game. I think that's really important. And because we're often very passionate <laughs> and, and uh, the sports industry is, is historically a very male dominated uh, industry, you know, we also need to be careful about the way that we approach things as well. That's speaking purely from the, the female perspective, but in terms of representation of Pacific people, um, I think, yeah, those are the things I would say. Collective voice, advocacy for those that, that can make it, and understanding and strategically using the political structures that are there. I hope that, I hope that answers your question, Anna. Yeah, no. Thank you, it just sounds like, yeah, it's, it's a long game. I think that was, that was a, Good answer to a, a, well, fortunately for you, it's evening, because if I got that in the morning, I don't know <laughs> whether I'd be quite <laughs> so eloquent. Um, so I think our next question is coming from Stephanie. Stephanie is running women's football development in Tahiti. Okay. Uh, hi, Sayar. I run. Hi, Steve. Hi. hi. Um, so it's a, it's a question about the, the FIFA forward for women football. So uh, FIFA has paid the full forward to all the, the federation. That's a good thing for our MAs, but um, what impact do you think it will have for women's football here in Oceania? To be honest, I think uh, without knowing intimately the situation in all the different countries, 
the, the reason for releasing those funds straight away was because many of our member associations are really struggling now. Um, uh, especially the ones who have, uh, who are reliant on outside income, not just the FIFA income. Um, and the idea of giving uh, the funding um, immediately was to try to support the member associations to avoid things like having to let staff go and stand people down or to uh, cut uh, activities. So I think it will help. I think what is really important uh, for, for those of you on this call, and I see there are many uh, that are in charge of women's football or involved in the women's game, is to be proactive in this time about making recommendations for women's football. So you don't have to wait in this situation to be asked by your general secretary or by your president or whoever it is uh, to, to, to do something for the women's game. This is your opportunity now to be proactive. So if everything is stopped right now, it's a really awesome time for everybody to do an assessment. Okay, who are our stakeholders, the clubs, uh, the leagues, whatever it may be, and looking at the impact that it's had on them and thinking ahead, okay, at some point we're going to come out of this situation. What recommendations can I give now to my general secretary or, or my technical director or boss proactively um, to see how we can keep the momentum for women's football when we come out of this situation. And by doing that, you're making sure that those decision makers who are in charge of the money, they've got women's football at the forefront in front of them while they make those decisions. And I think if you, if you approach it in a way where you're doing it in a, in a, a very collaborative and positive way, um, not, not that you're sort of kind of shoving something down their throats, if you know what I mean. Um, it also shows that you are being active in your role and you're taking ownership and responsibility for that area. Um, so that's definitely uh, one thing that I would encourage uh, all those that are in charge of women's football to do um, in the member countries. The other thing that I think is important is um, to look at the programs that you had going uh, prior to the coronavirus and to understand what are the what is needed in order to get those programs up and running again. So in many cases, uh, what we're seeing here in Europe, and I, uh, I'm not sure <laughs> intimately what the cases are like in the Pacific, but when we come back to playing football, it's not going to be in the same way. There's going to be different um, uh, measures in place where there are a limited number of people allowed to train or games have to be played in, in empty stadiums, for example. There can't be crowds gathering, those kind of things. So try to think ahead and anticipate what those changes will mean for you and see how you can already start to plan and adapt and adjust your programs so that when it does come to the time where football can restart and your activities can restart, you're ready straight off the bat. You don't have to spend that time formulating, formulating uh, the plan. Does that answer your question? <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. The other thing, Steph, is uh, keep an eye out for these development programs that are coming because they are exactly for this. I, um, we've really accelerated the timeline on these development programs because we know that our member associations are gonna need a boost of support when they come out of this coronavirus situation. So keep an eye out for those, and as soon as you get them, make sure that you apply uh, so that you can straight away start receiving the support from those programs as well. Another one to keep you on your toes, Sarai. Um, <laughs> so it sounds like Margaret from PNG has another question. Margaret, are you still there? Yes, I am. All right, go ahead. I read a newsletter yesterday from FIFA Technical Department, and it talked about um, giving every talent a chance or opportunity. Now, I don't know how that will tie in with um, the programs that you spoke about, Sarai, um, early on. Um, and there's also criteria to meet. 
now if we don't meet the criteria, what other options do we have available mm -hmm. to to qualify for a program or you know certain projects so that newsletter uh, is about a, a very very um, big program that FIFA was planning to launch um, that got kind of a little bit railroaded because of the coronavirus. And what it is, is uh, it's an in-depth analysis of the systems, um, the technical systems for elite football in all the member associations with the ultimate goal to improve uh, basically elite level football in our member countries and to try and close the gap um, that we see is ever growing uh, between the more developed football countries um, and those from the developing regions. So what the idea behind it was that every member association could apply to take part in this program and there are a, a series, uh, a set of experts basically that would uh, come into each of the member association countries to assess uh, what is the situation on the ground there, what systems do they have in place, and to really go deep into uh, an analysis of how the uh, development systems are working uh, for players in those respective countries. And the idea behind that is that then they would be able to offer tailor-made programs in order to support those individual countries. So as I understand it, all, uh, all the member associations are, uh, are able to apply. And I think we got more than 190 uh, countries responding and wanting to be part of that. Everybody will benefit in some way, but it's clear that there are some countries of those 211 that are far more advanced in terms of elite football. They have professional leagues going. Um, they have a, a much higher uh, elite environment and there are some countries that are more on the developing spectrum. So the only difference will be the, the, the type of support that comes out of it in the end. Um, and as I said, we're really focusing a lot on, on having a more tailor-made approach to our member associations now. Um, so you guys will be eligible, Margaret, definitely in Papua New Guinea but the type of support that will come out of this exercise for you will, will be different to, for example, what we might give to a country like Germany um, or, or Sweden, for example. Thank you. <laughs> and women's football is included in that, 100%, yeah. So one of the things that um, I think is really important for those that are working in the federations here is to keep a super tight, relationship with your technical department. So this is a program that's being run out of the technical division inside FIFA, but we have been there every step of the way in the development of the program and the rollout of the program and the training of all the experts to ensure that women's football is represented in every step of this project. And for those of you that are, are working in MAs, I know many of you are inside your technical departments, so it's really important to make sure that when uh, the technical guys are coming up with these kinds of projects, that you're there and that you're in those discussions um, so that women's football is also part of those projects when they roll out. Thank you, Sarai. <laughs> cool, another great question there from Margaret. <laughs> I sort of want to go back to the question that Anna asked and um, when you mentioned that you're the only person from the Pacific was sort of that um, in the halls of FIFA that you kind of come across, how do you kind of, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you look at that situation and, and keep on track? Because it can be quite isolating being the only person from a specific place or um, in, in an arena like that. So, um, do you feel that or is it something that you kind of can manage without thinking about the fact that you're kind of this lone island in a big sea? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, it's um, at the beginning uh, when I first arrived uh, to, to Switzerland um, and into FIFA, it was tough. I have to be really honest uh, because it was, yeah, I felt very, very isolated. Um, not only because I, I was alone in terms of my identity, 
uh, but also the culture shock. Like uh, coming from the Pacific region, you know how we are. Like we're very close to each other. We're joking all the time. We're talking, we're chatting. You know, we have a tight knit society and you know even if you don't know someone uh, if you're standing next to them in the line you end up having a conversation they probably end up being your cousin or something you know it's we're like this um, and coming here uh, it's completely the opposite it's completely the opposite um, the the people uh, the Swiss people in particular can be quite um, cold um, and I've learned over time that it's not that they're it's not that they're being mean, it's just their culture. Their culture is actually the complete opposite to us. They will not allow you to come in and be friendly with them until they've known you for a long, long time. And uh, so for me, that was a shock, you know, not being able to have the same kind of conversations and connections uh, was, was very difficult. Um, but it, it, now, uh, having adjusted, uh, to be honest, I, I wear my ethnicity as a badge of pride. And I love walking through the halls and wearing my flowers and wearing Pacific clothing and being different. And I love talking about it and I love the fact that I'm a representative of our region. And any moment I can, I take the opportunity to remind people about that. And when you come to my office, actually, it's like almost as if you're walking into a, a museum of the Pacific region because I've got all carvings, carver bowls, everything from around. I have a, a Māori carving uh, behind my desk. And uh, yeah, it's something that I'm really proud of. And uh, I'm very uh, aware that I wouldn't be in the position where I am today if I hadn't come from the Pacific region and if I hadn't started my journey in Samoa. And, you know, I will never forget that. And it's important for me that I honor that as well. So it's, it's something that I've adjusted to and um, I try to use it in a very positive way now. It looks like Lighty, our friend from Tonga has another question. Lighty, are you there? Yes, oh, thank you, Jackie. Um, just one more question, Sarai. Um, I attended the, the previous uh, webinar that uh, you, uh, we see you two weeks ago, and um, uh, you were mentioning something about uh, how the women's football has been, became a commercial uh, a product. And, um, um, how I, how I look at it with us from Pacific or Oceania, and uh, excluding New Zealand, that we are not even come close to uh, a new development uh, program that, that's tailor-made for women's football. Thank you very much for that, because the forward uh, came, it's, um, it's only a little bit that will assist us for women's football, but uh, maybe uh, for future, that uh, what have you been planned that just to include us? Because it's, you know, to see the beautiful of uh, football for women's, uh, it's uh, become stronger. And uh, yeah. And one, I congratulate you as you as uh, FIFA Women's World Cup last year. And uh, yeah, keep on doing the good work for us. Thank you, Sarai. <laughs> Thanks, Lighty. I, I don't know if it was just me, but the connection was a little bit uh, slow. But I think if I understood correctly, you wanted to know about uh, the commercial side of women's football and how, how yes. we can do something in the Pacific. Is that right? Yes, yes, correct. Yes. Okay, good question. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I've often thought of this, um, especially uh, uh, what I mean is I've often thought about how we can resolve this in the Pacific region specifically. Um, at a global level, uh, I can give you maybe the perspective there first. Uh, at FIFA, one of the top, top priorities in the women's football strategy is to commercialize the women's game. Um, and uh, yes. 
it's quite complicated because the way that uh, women's football is, uh, shall we say, commercialized at FIFA level, it's all tied together with the men's game. So in the past, uh, for example, if you were a commercial sponsor or a partner or a broadcaster and you wanted to buy uh, the rights to the Men's World Cup or be a sponsor for the Men's World Cup, um, the Women's World Cup was packaged together with it and you got given that all together. Yes. Um, like an add-on. And almost because of that, um, women's football has never been viewed within football until very recently as being a, a commercial product that can generate revenue that sponsors and partners are interested in. So mm -hmm. the next Women's World Cup actually will be the first edition of the Women's World Cup uh, for FIFA where we will be able to split away from the Men's World Cup in many of those contracts and sponsorships and to sell it as a separate commercial product and for me what is uh what was very very clear uh at the women's world cup in france last year was that there is a massive interest uh, commercially in terms of fans um there is a market out there that wants to consume women's football we had more than one billion people around the world that were tuning in to watch it um, and this is something that it, it's time now to test the product and to see how we can enhance it and use our athletes and use the, the, the values that women's football holds that maybe are lost a little bit in the men's game to align with some of those commercial partners. And I think the beauty of women's football, especially now, is, uh, and we saw this in France last year, there's a lot of conversations happening in society and globally at the moment around topics like gender equality and women's empowerment. And we saw in France, there was a lot of discussions that were happening around the tournament that were to do with things like equal pay, gender equality. And that shows yeah. to me that women's football can be a platform for those topics. And who else is interested in those topics? It's companies, organizations, they want to be seen to be aligned. It's important now for people to be seen to be fighting for things like gender equality, to be gender equal, to be diverse. And if women's football embodies all those virtues and those values, it's a perfect way to align with those companies that have those same values. So there is definitely a, a commercial opportunity for women's football now. And when you look at men's football, and this is something that, you know, coming from the Pacific uh, shocked me when I started to see and understand the numbers that are involved, the figures in terms of money that move in the men's game, how much players are paid, transfer fees, broadcast deals. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions and millions of dollars. And you look at where the women's game is now compared to that, and you see that gap. All that I see there is just opportunity, a massive opportunity. So if you're in charge of football uh, at FIFA level, at an MA level, even in the confederations, and you're thinking about where you should invest in order to get some returns, there's only one area where I see a huge growth potential, and that's in the women's game. And the same thing mm -hmm. applies for the Pacific. I think the thing in the Pacific is, is it's difficult because the, the truth of it is, even in the men's competitions and the men's leagues in the Pacific region are predominantly amateur. There are very few uh, countries um, that, that play professional football in the Pacific region. Um, even in New Zealand, to some extent, the, the professional team that New Zealand has, the Wellington Phoenix, they play in Australia uh, in the A-League, which is an Asian football uh, competition. So the Pacific region, um, football is, is an amateur sport there. Um, we do have people, of course, that are earning money to play and are able to play uh, to, to, to make a living. They also get you know, accommodation and things like that paid for. But it's a long way away from where we what we call uh, professional uh, commercialized uh, football. Um, so it's difficult for women 
uh, the women's game in that environment to commercialize when they're operating in a system of football that is completely amateur. But in saying that, there have been many success stories and we've seen them. And I think we have a really, really good moment now, especially coming out of coronavirus. There's going to be an important time where society needs to grasp things that are very positive to, to pull ourselves out of this situation. And I see sports, not only just football, but sports in general playing a very key role in that. And that is something that I think that we can leverage in the women's game for sure. Um, it's always been my experience that times of adversity are where the best opportunities lie. And I think coming out of this situation, um, when society is looking for something to pull them out and to get things back to normal, football is going to play a very, very key role there. And I think we need to leverage that in the women's game and anticipate how we can use that situation uh, to attract revenues, partners, uh, and, and get people on board. Thank it's you, a tough one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but it, it is, uh, uh, I think it's uh, like you say, it's an uh, eye opener for us from Oceania especially the development nations, uh, as we've been um, uh, very fortunate to be uh, having you sitting there and um, sometimes <laughs> probably soon that uh, we might, uh, you know, uh, can be uh, some of the Pacific Islands will be part of, uh, uh, you know, uh, like for example, Papua New Guinea and those strong countries in the uh, women's game. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs> now it's uh, so so clear and uh, we'll dream probably soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's always good to dream big. <laughs> it is. It is light here, and you have to and keep that positive mindset. That is so important. Yeah. Always good to hear from you, Lighty. Um, Thank you. Question. Another really good question, actually, because um, commercialization of football, but um, and and also women's football, I guess, um, is something that I guess is on the minds of a lot of people at the um, going sort of ahead of coronavirus and coming out of it. It's going to be important as well. Um, so we have another question. This one is coming from Maya Vank, who, if I am uh, correct is the Capital Football Women's Football Development Officer. Mark. Yes, I am. Sorry, you can just hear my dog in the background coughing. Um, yes, coming from New Zealand. Um, thanks, Rai, for everything so far. Um, I guess you've touched on this a wee bit already, just in your last question around commercialisation and kind of women's opportunity there. Um, my question to you is, like, what would you recommend that women's football be treated as a separate conversation to men's football, which is kind of the path where we're on and we're going down um, as it's in a different stage and it's kind of emerging still um, as a global kind of area of football. Or should we change the conversation to men's and women's football just being part of one conversation? And um, when we talk about football, just expecting that it's men's football and women's football is part of that one conversation. Um, like when I think back to my job, uh, which is yeah, women's football development, um, it's obviously at the forefront of my mind, but it's not of the forefront of my colleagues' minds. Um, and it's not their responsibility, it's kind of my responsibility. So if we tie it to this responsibility of everyone, will that just get lost potentially? I'm just looking for a little bit of guidance um, in that area. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, to be honest, the ultimate goal should be for all of us is that women's football becomes mainstream. And it may be a long time away and it may not even happen in our lifetime, but the goal should always be that we talk about football. It's not women's football and men's football, it's just football. And whilst uh, we're far away from that, I think it's important that there is a, an accelerator or a point of focus or almost like an incubator for women's football inside football organizations. 
Um, and that's where I think it's important where people like you who play a specific role dedicated to women's football, you can provide the expertise, the strategy, the understanding about the women's football landscape, but you also need to make sure that your colleagues are equally as aware and accountable for women's football. And I know that's not a, an easy thing. And to be honest, it's a daily challenge, even for me at FIFA level, um, to drive accountability for women's football across the whole organization. And I think that's where having a clear strategy is really, really important. So at FIFA, we have a, a, a strategy that we launched in 2018, and it covers all areas of women's football. There are five key areas, including you know, uh, commercialization and marketing, competitions, development, uh, leadership and governance, uh, you know, social responsibility, all the different aspects of the women's game. And when we developed that uh, strategy, we engaged with everyone within the organization and external stakeholders to be part of that conversation and to be part of the development of that strategy. And the objectives that are in there were made together with those people that are accountable for those other areas. So now we have the strategy, it's been launched, it's much easier for me to go and have those conversations with those other departments, to be able to say, hey guys, commercial strategy, okay, you guys are the commercial division, you're in charge of driving the sales and the partnerships and the selling the broadcast rights, let's get together, this is what we've stated in our strategy, you guys were part of this. And it, it helps a lot as a tool to really drive people uh, to, to be accountable as well. Um, yeah, ultimately for me, my ultimate goal is to do myself out of the job. Um, that it shouldn't need someone like me to run around telling everybody to think about women's football, that it just comes naturally for everyone who's involved in the game. Um, and, and that's our challenge and, and it is tough. But if you're passionate about it and you know, uh, you know your stuff, you know, it makes it a lot easier. But I think it's really interesting what you said in the beginning about whether we should look at women's football and men's football differently. And it's a very fine balance, to be honest, because if we push too hard to have women's football as a separate product and to be treated separately and to have its own kind of structures and, and resources, we're actually isolating ourselves. And I think that that approach can sometimes uh, have a, even more of a negative impact than it can a positive one. To be honest, football is one ecosystem and women's football shouldn't be viewed as a threat to the men's game. Um, and I think by approaching it strategically in a way where it can be as one and embraced as one, and we can complement what is happening in the men's game, um, it is a much better way to approach it. And it also makes it more sustainable because the people who are ultimately responsible and involved in men's football become involved in women's football. The fans, uh, the people who are participating, it starts to normalize. Um, and, and that's what makes it sustainable. So it's a fine balance because women's football should also be treated uh, it should be looked at as a as a sport that is unique because we have values, I think, and and uh, aspects of the women's game that are actually quite special that we can leverage in our roles. Um, so in that way, uh, we certainly should should look at those separately and how we can use them. But in terms of the overall big picture, I, I'm certainly an advocate that we should align um, and, and be together with the men's game. If our goal is to mainstream, then we have to do it from the beginning and we can't turn away those that are involved in men's football. Great, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, another good point, I think. It's hard to, to balance the two and, and think about moving forward because there's always um, the separation and it's good to hear that it's good but also bad like you because that's how it feels when you're in it like um, knowing that there is still a lot of 
minds that need to be changed to, towards women's football. Um, and it's not just at MA level or in small countries, it's kind of a global thing. Um, yeah. Um, some really, really great questions and great discussions. I guess I just want to emphasise that these conversations and questions don't need to just be confined to this forum. Um, I would encourage each of you to reach out to me where possible. Um, I think Jackie's going to chuck my email address in there, but more than welcome to reach out to me anytime, whether it, that's a phone call or an email. Um, Soraya and I have I guess regular catch-ups as well so I can always fire any questions through to her that I'm unable to answer. Um, I think it's been clear today how much passion and love Sarai has for the Pacific. Um, we know she makes herself available for us and it's really important that we do reach out to her when we need it so thank you Sarai um, for that it is much appreciated. But lastly from me just a big thanks to Jax for putting this call on. Um, it was her idea, I guess, to, to bring all of us together um, to get Sarai on the, on the phone and be able to have some of these conversations. So for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Jax has created the Pacifica Sisters Facebook page, Instagram page and website. Um, and I guess a big part of that is profiling women in the Pacific that are doing an incredible job. So we've had Sarai, we've had Margaret on there. Um, no doubt more of you will be um, sought out by Jax as well, uh, but it is really important, although it can feel awkward and we're not good at promoting ourselves, um, it is great to do that and I think with Jax's talent she can really help, um, help do that and put us out there um, so people can see the great job that so many of us are doing. So thank you to everyone who's been involved with the call today, uh, reach out anytime, um, I'll be happy to, to chat more after this call. Awesome. Thanks so much, Emma, and thanks for the shout out for the site. Um, it's good to, you know, like I know how difficult it is um, to get women's football out there and especially women's football from the Pacific and also just to, um, to promote ourselves because, like you said, um, as Pacific people, we're not the first to, to put ourselves forward for, for promotion um, and it's just been and I, and I've met so many people who just deserve to have their their work their accolades promoted so that's sort of what the basis of the website and so part of today's forum was also about community so knowing that there's people out there that we can get in touch with um, so it's you know everyone that's on here today um, now you know there are people who love women's football in the Pacific so if you feel like you need to reach out, if you feel like, uh, you know, it's been pretty hard, um, get in touch with any, any of the people that are here. Um, you know, I can, through the website, I can put you in touch with people. Emma can put you in touch with people. So um, if you don't have those contacts and you want to, to get to know someone a bit better and find out what their situation is in their country, you know, just let us know and we'll, we can help you out with that. Um, and it's also been about trying to stay motivated. So one of the things I asked Sarai to do was put together a little playlist of what she, what she listens to to um, get herself pumped up for work or, or for a workout while she's in lockdown. So um, I'll chuck the link into uh, the chat so everyone can find out the dirty secrets of what Sarai listens to. Um, <laughs> And uh, so thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. I know it's early for a lot of us and it's late for Sarai, but it's just been so cool to see all the smiling faces and just to catch up with everyone. Um, and then I guess I'll leave the final word for Sarai, the uh, queen of women's football <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Sarai. Um, yeah, just thank you so much, uh, Jax uh, and Emma. Uh, this is a really, really great initiative. And uh, yeah, like you said, you know, we don't do enough in the Pacific to promote ourselves and our region. And honestly, we should, because, you know, especially for me, having experienced uh, now a few years uh, in Europe and kind of at the global level, there is no other region like the Pacific region. And there are so many qualities about our people and our culture that are incredible. And, and 
you just don't see it anywhere else in the world. And there's no place that's more welcoming. There's the people are so passionate. Our cultures are so beautiful and there's no reason why we shouldn't be promoting ourselves, each other, the work that we're doing, all of it, you know, and uh, I will always wave the flag uh, for our region and uh, our countries and for all of you. And please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me um, if you need help or support or anything like that. I'm here and I have all the time in the world for, for you guys.